We've been talking some about the name or the word uh, believer, believers. And uh, I, I, I like that word because it not only tells who we are, it tells what we do. We are a believer. How did you get saved? You believed, right? How do we get anything from God? We have faith, we believe, right? So it's important that we have believed, and it's important that we continue to believe. Amen? Um, I was thinking of, uh, you know, believers actually know their God. Now, there are people that believe in a lot of religions and a, and a lot of creeds and, and uh, things of that nature. I'm not sure if they really have any idea of who their God is. You know, isn't that something? Uh, but we, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we are told... To know our God. Know Him. Praise God. I, I was thinking of the scripture found over in the book of Daniel chapter 11 verse 32. Uh, and this is referring here. Um, don't necessarily need to go there unless you want to. But anyway, uh, Daniel referring there to the Jews of course. And talking about some of the Jews had done wickedly against the covenant. They they did not honor the covenant that God had made with them and uh, as children of Abraham. Uh, but in that last part of that 32nd verse, here's what it says. But the people, listen to this, the people that do know their God. There are a people that know their God. And what are those people? They are people who are what? strong, and do exploits. You know what that tells me? If we do not know our God, we probably are not going to be very strong. And we're not going to do very many exploits if we don't know our God. <laughs> Hallelujah. So that's our uh, assignment here. What I want to talk to you for a little while today is getting to know our God in a close, intimate way. And if we know Him, then our faith will only become stronger. Our believing will become more firm. Amen? So let me tell you something, there are evil forces out here in the world today that will try to get you over into unbelief. That's right. Cause you to doubt something about your salvation or whatever. Uh, that may be a message for some time in the future, but I'm just telling you there are those kind of forces in the world today that do not want you to believe in the Almighty God. All right? But here's what we're going to do. We're going to believe in Him. <laughs> Amen. We're going to believe in Him. Uh, now you can go with me now if you want to the uh, Gospel of St. Luke chapter 18. And um, if you go down, I'm going to lay a little bit of background here before I read about three or four verses of Scripture here. Um, in verse 18 of Luke 18, uh, it tells about a rich young ruler that had... Come to Jesus, called him good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him, you know, uh, about keeping the commandments. Uh, and you know the story, I'm sure. But anyway, it had to do with he was rich, but he was not willing to part with his riches. Wow. Now, he, he did not know his God, <laughs> I'm telling you. He might have kept the commandments, but I'm here to tell you, he really didn't know God because, you know, the Bible says that uh, Jesus told him there what said, you know, uh, these things uh, he's kept and, and um, you know, 
that he was to give to the poor, distribute unto the poor. He wasn't willing to do it. If he had really knew his God, he could have knew over in the book of Proverbs where it says, He that lendeth unto the Lord, God will, has mercy on the poor, lendeth to the Lord, to that person God will repay. Did you know that? So Jesus was actually setting him up to become more wealthy than he ever was. But uh, uh, he decided he was wanting to hold on to what he had. So, but anyway, that was the background story here. And in verse 27, Jesus said, Now, uh, or the question was asked in verse 26. Uh, they asked him, and they probably could have been Peter, you know. Peter said, uh, Who then can be saved? Who then can be saved, you know? Uh, but Jesus said, these things are impossible with men, but they are possible with God. And then in verse 28, Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And I believe they did. Many of those uh, disciples that Jesus says, Come, follow me, come, follow me, they left their livelihood. I mean, they went right with Him, right? In verse 29, Jesus answered Peter when He said, We've given all. What's in it for us? What's in it for us? Here's what he said, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left a house, parents, brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake. Verse 30 says, Who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Now, Jesus was not promoting people leaving their families and, and doing those things, but He was given an example here of you cannot outgive God. Plain and simple. Whatever you are willing to invest in the kingdom of God, let me tell you something. God keeps a record. He knows. He knows. Amen. Now, so what these few verses of Scripture here is talking about is uh, verses 28 through 30. It's talking about being a believer in Jesus. Jesus is the Lord, a man of the kingdom, amen. And also being consecrated to his service. It's one thing to make Jesus the Lord, you said, the Lord of your life, but then what are you going to do with your life after that, after you've become born again, become saved? What are you going to do with your life? Jesus is actually referring here, we are to enter into the service of God, be consecrated, right? Be sanctified, be consecrated to God. And it's then that you open up that door of blessings See, the rich young ruler didn't enter in that door. But you can open up that door of where what you do can be profitable unto you. You know, I, I don't like doing unprofitable things. I feel like I'm wasting my time. <laughs> that, makes, that almost makes too much sense, doesn't it? But yeah... Uh, but if you do profitable things, guess what? You're going to profit. 
That's what I want to do. I want to invest my time, my money, my abilities or whatever into profitable things. Paul told Timothy this. He said, godliness is profitable unto all things. Godliness. Keep that in mind. Amen. Now, having said that, let's go to the book of James. James chapter 2. Two. And let's go down to verse 14. James 2 and 14 tells us this, as we are, yes, talking about believing, talking about having faith, and here's what it says, What doeth it profit my brethren? There's that word profit again. Though a man can say that he has faith and he does not have works, can faith save him? Now, we don't need to get confused over that because we know that it's not by the works of the law that we are saved, right? Paul made that very clear in Ephesians 2 and 8 where he says, For by grace are we saved through faith, that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God and not of works should any man boast. So you do not get born again. You do not get saved uh, by your works. What he's talking about in Ephesians 2 and 8 is the redemption of our spirit man. All right, hope that's clear. Now, but he's saying here that there is a place for works. There is a place, if you want to be entering in, like James is going to explain here, into a life of faith, of believing God, investing in the king, sowing seed into the good ground, if you will. Uh, because some people said, well, I got saved, but then again, I don't know really what's in, in it for me, and, and uh, if I invest into the kingdom of God, how do I know that I'm going to get a return? Well, let me tell you something. God will never be indebted to any man. He will not. God pays his debts. So if you give, God's going to give back to you, right? Good measure, pressed down, running over, shaking together. Men give unto your bosom, he'll cause them to happen. Now, I want us to look the book of Hebrews. Yeah, flip right back over here to the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 6, if you will. And uh, let's go down to verse 10. Hebrews 6 and 10. And here's what the writer says. For God is not unrighteous. He's not. He is a righteous God. Now, He is not unrighteous. He will not forget your work. Now, I, I want my work to be built upon uh, a solid foundation, don't you? Amen. Uh, wood, hay, and stubble gets burned up when the fire comes through, right? Gold, silver, precious stones will stand the test of fire. And your house will stand, amen? We want a house that will stand. So, God is saying here, He will not forget your work. Other people may. You may even think everything you've done for God is for naught. But let me tell you something. God does not forget. Amen? Or your labor of love. How about that? See, when you do those things, you're sowing good seed. And God's the, the protector of your seed. He'll bring forth a harvest. Which you have shewed toward His name. Now, if somebody's out here trying to do some kind of work for God and it's not in the name of, of Jesus, 
Well, it's for naught. We understand that. But we do it in His name. As, as He says, you have ministered to the saints and you do minister. So right there tells you that God remembers and God will not forget your work in the kingdom of God. Now let's go back to the book of James uh, chapter 2 again. Because people can simply think, well, I'll just speak words. And now it's important to speak words. Words are powerful, we know all that. But, but James gives an example here. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart, be in peace, and be ye warmed and filled, and notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does that profit? Nothing. Amen. It takes a believer, can say, I'm a believer can make all kinds of proclamations and talk big swelling words or whatever else. But really, James, old practical James here, is getting right down to the nitty-gritty, if you will, and saying here, take that as an example, that doesn't profit that person anything because it didn't have works, and if it didn't have works, it's dead. Right? So faith... If it does not have works, it's dead. And uh, it, verse 18 says, A man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. <laughs> and he said, I'm going to show you my faith by my works. You can see the results of faith. Right? Faith brings results. It's meant to bring results, right? Right? So, anyway, uh, faith without works is dead. So, we are to do works. And, and I want to say this again. A believer is not working to be saved. He is working because he is saved. I like that. Hallelujah. All right, now, we go on. Uh, go with me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And um, this may have been, I guess, one of the first books that the Apostle Paul wrote, uh, some people think, but one, one of the first. But here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, here's what uh, he says to the church of Thessalonica. He says, he did this in his prayers. Paul prayed a lot. And this is one of his prayers. He says, I make mention of you in my prayers. And he said, I, I'm remembering without ceasing your work of faith. Right there you have it again, right? A work of faith. Not just a speaking out a word and saying, have faith. But actually it's the works that James was talking about. Your work of faith, and notice the next statement. What is it? Labor of love. Labor of love. And then the patience of hope that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. Now, uh, so we have here a true believer is has a work of faith, a labor of love, and also a patience of hope. Now when you talk about hope, you tend to think about, well, I have this blessed hope that Jesus Christ is coming back. Amen? Do you have that hope? That is hope. It's not happened yet, but I sure believe it will. Amen? So I'm putting that in my patience, waiting for the harvest, waiting for the Lord to come. Amen? Patience of hope. Now, let's go just a little bit deeper in explanation of this work and labor of love. Uh, in uh, 1 John chapter 3, and I want to go down to uh, verse 
18, he says, John says this, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue. Hmm? Now, that does, he's not saying that you shouldn't go to somebody and say, I love you. But, if you say you love somebody, and you still hate your brethren, <laughs> well, we know the truth is not in you, right? So, it's more than just a statement of saying, I love you. He says it needs to be done, what? Indeed, D-E-E-D, deed, -E -E that's your actions, that's your work, if you will, and in truth, and we are of the truth. Amen? So that's what the requirements. So here's what it is. Love demands action. Now you could use love in the form of a noun, or you can use it here in the form of a verb. It needs to be used not just as a noun, it needs to be used as a verb. Verb is an action, right? Show people you love them. Amen? Show people as God has shown you. Now, here's what happens. The faith that James was talking about over there, the faith that has some works involved, right? is something that can be used as, and, and I like when things work together. I really, really do. <laughs> and God's Word does work together, and these things here work together. Just like uh, I read there in First Thessalonians, you know, where Paul talked about there was uh, faith and there was uh, hope and there was charity. You know, Paul used those words together different times, right? Now by faith, hope, and charity, and greatest of these is charity, right? So things can work together, and here's how I see in the, in the Word of God that these can work together as you strive to do one, it affects and helps another one of these uh, virtues, we'll say. Faith actually will energize your work. Have you ever tried to do something and you, I have no idea how this is going to turn out. It looks like it's going to blow up before I get it done. <laughs> You're, oh man. Throw the towel in now before I waste all my energy. You ever been there? But if you have faith, you can go at that task do it heartedly as unto the Lord. <laughs> Man, you can feel that energy coming out, can't you? Praise God. See, the devil's wanting to discourage you and God's wanting to encourage you. Now, faith will energize because you're believing. If I do a good work, my faith is God's going to bring that into fruition. It's going to produce, produce fruit. Amen? For the master's table even. Amen? So you get excited. You get built up. Now, here again. Faith. 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 A little bit of faith. Alright. But still, what did Paul say concerning in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13? You know, you can have all the faith to move a mountain. But if you do not have love, doesn't profit you again, right? So your faith, energizing your work, has to be motivated by love. The Bible tells us, you know, in the book of Galatians, I believe, it's faith that worketh by love. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So keep those in mind. And the hope is something that will anchor 
your soul while you are working in the kingdom of God. Amen? It's an anchor that does hold the soul of man. Amen? James 1.25, I want us to take a quick look at that. Uh, here's, uh, here's what he says in, uh, okay, here we go. James 1.25, listen closely here. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and you continue therein, Yes, we are talking about the Word of God here. The perfect law of liberty. And if you are not a forgetful hearer, but you become a doer of the what work? W-O-R-K? That's what it says in my book, my Bible. And you be a doer of the work, well, that's a blessed man because he'll be blessed in his deed or in his actions or in his work. A believer, back to a believer again, a believer, number one, is supposed to obey God. And be an active doer of the Word. Now, works, as I said a while ago, can be burned up. But works of obedience unto God will stand the test of time. You can have faith in that. You can have confidence in that. And if you know what you're doing in obedience unto God, then you are going to so be blessed in your work. Hallelujah. Man, I, I'm, I'm here to tell you this morning, believing God's exciting. Some people want to make faith as some, oh, you never know what's out there and you're stabbing around in the dark and everything else. No, God did not intend for faith to be some kind of a struggle all the time. <laughs> oh, if I could just get enough faith, if I could, and I'm working so hard. I know, I believe in God and having faith should come easy for a believer. Impossible with an unbeliever, but with a believer it should come pretty easy, hadn't it? Amen? Hmm. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? So, faith is believing God. And the better we know Him through His Word, the better we know Him, the easier it's going to be to trust Him. A lot of people don't know whether they can trust God or not. Really? Yeah, I'm convinced of that. They don't really know. Is God trustworthy? If I give Him this, if I give Him my last... Two cents out of my pocket. Does that mean he's going to forsake me or not? No, if you know your God, <laughs> and your God does not forget, and he will not forsake, and he told you to do it, you can do it with all kinds of confidence, and you can trust him. You can go to bed at night and lay your head on your pillow and go right to sleep. God's got in control. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, yeah. Uh, go with me, if you would, to the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 5. Okay? Uh, this is a chapter here of how the uh, great captain Naaman you know, the king 
the host of the king of Syria, a great man, verse 1. Uh, how Naaman got healed. You know the story. Uh, he was honorable. Uh, he was also a mighty man of valor. But he was also a leper, right? I tell you what, you can have a lot in this old world. You can be like the rich man that says, I'm going to pull down my barns and I'm going to build greater. But then God, this night thy soul is required of thee. And then, who are all of these other things going to be? Well, you sure ain't going to take them with you. Somebody else is going to have them. Amen. Naaman knew that. I have reached the pinnacle of power. I'm respected in every way, shape, and form. But I know I've got a disease. Be deadly. All right? Well, we won't go into the whole story, but it's a wonderful story. A little maid that was there in the house of, of uh, Naaman. Um, she waited on Naaman's wife, actually. She had a good word for the household of Naaman, didn't she? There is a prophet... <laughs> In Israel. And all right, she made the connection of where the king could get together. And sure enough, it panned out there was Elisha that was in the nation there. Now, if we go down to verse 11. Well, no, let's go down to verse 9. Let's do that. It says, Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. I mean, he showed up with his entire entourage. Horses, chariots, everything. Man, when I go, I go full out. That's how he showed up at the household of Elisha. Hmm. Verse 10. Elisha sent a messenger unto him. Go and wash in Jordan seven times. And thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Clean. Now... That was kindly insulting, I'm sure, to Naaman. <laughs> Wouldn't you think so? I mean, here I show up here and, well, it just ain't panning out right. And what's the nerve of this prophet Elisha, at least not showing his face, he had to send a messenger huh, to tell me something to do. Well, that made, verse 11 now, that made Namath wroth, or angry. And he went away and said, Behold, I thought. I tell you what, that's where a lot of people can get into a lot of trouble, is when they begin thinking. <laughs> This mind needs to be renewed by the Word of God. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Amen. And until it is, your thoughts are going to be similar to what Naaman's was. Well, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand. And he'd call on the name of the Lord his God. And he would strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Amen? Well, that would have been a dramatic display of power, wouldn't it? Let me tell you something, though. In this case, that was not what was needed. Because, we're going to learn a little faith lesson right here. Because Naaman was not in a state of humility. He was actually allowing that old pride, sin nature, to rise up in him. 
You understand what I'm saying? And how many knows God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble? Amen? So uh, he, he was trying to do it more in pride. Now, notice down here in verse uh, 13, um, he says, uh, And his servants came nigh and spoke unto him, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? In other words, yeah. We like to think, and I'm going to get back on, on to grace real heavy right here. We try to save ourselves, don't we? God's grace is sufficient. You ought to trust and believe in it. That's what Naaman was thinking. And that's what his servants uh, said to him. Uh, if this prophet had asked you to do some great thing, you'd have done it and, and then uh, you'd have got a little bit of glory out of your miracle. <laughs> no, no, no. To God be the glory. We don't deserve any of it. And let me tell you something else. Another lesson he was trying to teach right there, to Naaman especially, is that obedience is better than sacrifice. Oh, how we love to sacrifice things and we feel so good about ourselves. And God may say, no, I want you to do something else. God's watching over us, let me tell you. He can spot pride and arrogance quicker than anybody. Amen? Now, in verse 14... It says, and then went he down and dipped himself, Naaman did, seven times in Jordan. Nothing magical here about the number seven, but it's just completion. According to the saying of the man of God, he finally decided, I'm going to do what the prophet, the man of God said. And when he did, his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Let me tell you, he dipped in the old muddy Jordan. Thank God we have a fountain filled with blood that can wash our sin and our sickness and our diseases away. Amen. But we need to come, not the way I thought, <laughs> but we need to come the way God said to come. And let me tell you something. When he said in verse 14... Uh, uh, in verse 15, I'm sorry. Behold, he, he returned to the man of God, and he and all of his company came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know, I know, there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Amen. So he went from thinking to knowing. He quit thinking. When he quit thinking... And he started acting upon the word of the prophet. You can take that one home with you. He got something. Amen. Acting upon the word of the Lord. Amen. He did it in faith. Faith gets the job done. So, believing in God will give us a rest to our souls. Amen. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And the book of Proverbs says... <laughs> We don't do things with our own understanding. Amen? But we obey God. I want to read one other verse of Scripture found in, in closing in the book of Philippians. And I want us to go to chapter 1. 
And um, let's, let's go down to verse 20. Philippians 1 and 20. And we'll begin reading. It says here, according, Paul speaking, to my earnest expectation and my hope. There's that word hope again. There in that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, now this is a mouthful, with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. You remember the first scripture I read out of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, and it talked about consecration? Let me tell you, friends, what Paul just said there is total consecration. Total. I don't care whether it's by my dying or by my living. I belong to God. Amen? I don't know how you could even think about getting any more consecrated than that. Amen? But he said, for me to live as Christ and die as gain. What he's talking about here, we won't cover all that. And He was in a strait between two, having a desire to part and be with Christ, which is far better. But to abide. See, if he abided here in the flesh, he could still do his work. What was his work? Preaching the gospel. Being a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So he said here, but but if he went on to be with Christ, his work here on this earth would stop as far as him physically being here. Think about it. But he was consecrated either way. Lord, whichever. Now, Verse 25, and having this confidence, I know, God had told him, that he would abide and continue with them for their furtherance. And I'm closing with this thought. And the joy of their faith. Your Bible say that? Joy of faith? <laughs> I, 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 I thought faith was always a fight. You was always just having to punch and scrabble and, and get down and wrestle around and do all this and that. Paul is saying here, church, that I believe there is a place in Christ that there is a joy in believing and in trusting and having faith in God that you will not find anywhere else in this world. Amen? Paul's life was the work of God, consumed by it. Amen. Would you stand with me? This